Thank you, Pastor Harry, for the kind welcoming words. And to you, my brothers and sisters, it's a privilege to greet you in Jesus' name. Glad that you are here. Uh, I want to start off by saying or expressing my deep appreciation for this church under the leadership of Pastor Harry and Vinette and the team with them for really being church, not a club. Uh, I think you as a church understand something of the Great Commission and Jesus' words to the disciples in Acts 1.8 that being a mission church, a missionary church, a sending church uh, involves not only Jerusalem but up to the ends of the world. And from my heart, I really want to say thank you to those of you who in the past have participated in whatever way in spreading the life-giving gospel of Jesus Christ. And also to those this morning here that will be convinced from this day you want to be part of God's team of men and women. Uh, I'm just concerned sometimes that the church, especially in the West, Western world, has become a very closed, uh, ex, uh, uh, ex, yeah, closed community, a club almost, uh, while the church is the one organization who is not there for themselves, they are there for the world. So. It's a privilege to be here, and it's a privilege to share with you a word that I have on my heart. And the, the theme of this word is passengers or crew. Passengers or crew. I want to read to you from Luke chapter 5, verse 1 to 11. And if you have a Bible, please turn to it, or else listen carefully, because this is one of my favorite scriptures. And... Um, it's one of those, apart from the fact that I've been there so many times where this took place, uh, there on the northern, northwestern side of the Sea of Galilee, but uh, it's something that I can clearly or easily picture for myself, get the picture of what was happening here, but listen to the words. <clears throat> so it was, as the multitude pressed upon him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, that's the Sea of Galilee, and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land, which was obviously <coughs> an important strategic request not to be uh, engulfed by the people because there were masses of people following him and also for the acoustics that is much better from uh, across a few meters of water. Uh, when, he sat, when he had stopped speaking, verse 4, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night. I don't want to go into detail, but the fact of the matter is that fishing, commercial fishing on the Sea of Galilee takes place in, in the night time. There's practical reasons for that that I, that's, I don't want to go into now. In other words, they caught the right time, of the day or night, right place. But then he says, nevertheless, oh yeah, we've toiled all, all night and caught nothing. So, even though he did everything right, he had no argument when Jesus told him uh, the, in the following words, he says, uh, launch out into the deep and set down, let down your nets for a catch. Jesus was not a fisherman. He was, he was a, uh, a, a, a carpenter, a carpenter. So one could, wouldn't expect that, uh, that a carpenter would advise the fisherman. But they had, in any case, they had nothing to show 
They had nothing to, to lose because they did catch nothing with all their right techniques. So they obeyed him. And that's why Peter says in verse 6, in verse 5, he says, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled their partners in the other boat, which seems to be John and James, to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. In the Greek, it actually says they wanted to, to, to on the brink of sinking. Was, they, were, they, was, they were totally full. Uh, just imagine, we know the size of those boats in the time of Jesus. There's a copy, not a copy, original one that was discovered a couple of years ago that is uh, visible at a, you can see it at a museum next to the lake. But we know that those boats, specifically the one of Peter, more than once carried 12 disciples plus Jesus, so it was 13 men. And estimate uh, weight uh, that, that those boats could carry was a one ton. So there were so many fishes in the net that two of these boats, more or less two ton, two tons of fish, uh, were catched that night. Now there's never been before and up to this day, there's never been one occasion where with one throw of the net, two tons of fish were caught in the Sea of Galilee. So it was a great, magnificent miracle. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees. Imagine, there in this boat that was overfilled with fish, somehow he managed to, between those uh, slimy fish to kneel down and he prayed to Jesus, he said to Jesus, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all those who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought the, their boats to land, they forsook it all and followed him. I want to focus only on those few words in the 10th verse, where Jesus said, from now on, you will catch men. Jesus used the context of where this miracle happened. In a fishing boat, having caught a great harvest of fish, uh, telling Peter that from now on he will no longer be a, a catcher of fish, but a catcher of men. There are so many similarities between these two uh, works, catching fish and catching men. The, the one great difference is when you catch a fish, it's about to die. It will die, except if it's, you put it back. Uh, but if, you, if, you, if we as believers catch a sinner, he begins to live. It's the start of new life. It's not the start of death. He is in a state of death, spiritual death. But life comes, eternal life, the moment you become part of the kingdom of God. Now there's a few uh, similarities and a few principles that I want to point to uh, in this short word that I want to bring to you. The fact that Jesus called his first disciples from amongst fishermen. We know that the majority of the 12 disciples, perhaps with two or three exceptions, were all fishermen from around the Lake of Galilee. And he called specifically those men to partner in the Great Commission. Now, you may wonder why. I think if we no fisherman, if you perhaps you yourself a fisherman, whether you catch in, in dams or in the sea, uh, a fisherman has a certain attitude, a certain focusedness, certain commitment 
that is not the average with other people. Uh, most fishermen will just continue time after time. They may catch like Peter nothing that night or in the day or whenever. That, that's usually my testimony when I went fishing in the past, which is not very often. Uh, my my, my, my uh, report is more or less the same than Peter's. I've tried hard, I worked hard, but I catch nothing. So whether they caught anything, whether it was cold or windy or rainy, they would come back again and try again. They will try again. They will continue. They won't give up hope. They, will, they will, are willing, fishermen are willing to sacrifice a lot, suffering circumstances, weather, but they will just continue. There's something, something of this persistence, this, this boldness and this patience to try and try again. And I wonder how many of us to have the same passion for, for lost souls, where we are called to win for Jesus, for a lost and broken world. Uh, this is so important, and I think it's, it's, it's necessary for me, and for you perhaps, to just put our hand in our own bosom and ask, how does my commitment compare to that of a fisherman? Now secondly, uh, I've, it, 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 I noticed, and it's interesting to me, I don't know whether you've ever thought about it, that Jesus, as I said, mainly called, uh, the original disciples mainly called them from the fishing trade. He didn't call any hunters. I don't know about one of his 12 disciples that, that was a hunter. He called fishermen. And I wonder whether there's a specific reason for that. You know what a hunter does? Uh, he hunts down an animal. He will try to come as close the, to the animal as possible, kill it, and, and that's the way he works. While in a fishing situation, it's actually not the fisherman that catches the fish. The fish, ca fish catches itself. You put out the bait, and the fish catch or, or, or take hold of the bait. So I wondered in the past that the years that I've come in ministry, uh, my study in the, especially the Pentecostal movement, to what extent we oftentimes, our, our main method of trying to win souls, or even though it was well intended, good, the intentions were good, we act like hunters and not fishermen. And most people don't like to be hunted. They, they are very uh, sincere on their private space, their privacy. And they don't like you to, to just come in without any invitation. If they invite you, it's another thing. But I think oftentimes in our fervor and our commitment, we try to hunt them down. Uh, so they, they didn't open their heart's door for us. They didn't open their minds for us. And they, they close down everything when you, when you approach them like a hunter. While in, 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 with a fisherman, it's different. And of course, we, we get different kinds of fishing. And it's also noted, important to notice this. There are great commercial fishers uh, and fishing boats that use nets and uh, that catch large numbers of fish at one, at one time. And in Africa specifically, and to a, a certain extent in uh, Central and South, uh, South, uh, South America, it still works. Net fishing still works. You can pitch a tent somewhere in dark Africa, uh, put up a, a light outside and uh, drive around with a, with a speaker and invite people and they will come in throngs to the tent because it's, it's, uh, it's not uh, religion as such is, is part of their lifestyle and they, they would like to see especially if they hear about miracles there but it doesn't work the same when you pitch a tent in Newcastle or in uh, Cape Town uh, most people would not be interested. They've got negative associations with the tent. So thank God for those who have in the past and still evangelists 
that still uses nets. Although sometimes I've wondered, especially when I hear it up in Africa where uh, the soil is very fertile, spiritual soil is very fertile, uh, there was, was so many hundreds of thousands or even millions of people that attend one service and so many hundreds of thousands will kneel out and, and accept Jesus and how many of those people have done it four or five or six times in the past but that's okay as long as those efforts go on where it is working but the reality of the matter is that in most parts of the world you don't catch fish anymore by nets I'm talking about spiritually now in the western world liberal humanistic postmodernistic western world Net fishing, in terms of gospel terms, doesn't work so well anymore. And even so, in your countries where the church uh, is persecuted and evangelism is not allowed, you can't hire a stadium in India or in China or in Saudi Arabia or in Pakistan or one of those Muslim-dominated countries or atheist countries like China uh, and publicly announced that there will be a gospel service, it will just not happen. So that's why in the, in, in the underground churches in those countries, uh, it's a one-by-one one fishing, like a person who stands on, a, on a, the seashore with a fishing rod and catch fishes one by one. And this kind of spiritual fishing is more and more what happens. So in, on the one hand, I want to salute this church for reaching out in whatever way possible. But I must tell you that much of the money you invest in, in mission work, far or near, eventually result in people being won one by one. If you listen to, to uh, our brother from, from, uh, from France, the, with the Turkish Muslims and, and the underground church in China. Uh, oftentimes it's low, relatively small assemblies and the people were not one in, 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 in great numbers at, at one time. They were one, one by one by one. So it's important to realize that we're living in a time, we're living in a country, we're living in a space where most of the fishing that the church can do is not by two or three major evangelists moving around with big tents and stadiums. It's by people like you and you and you and you who make contact with people in terms of relationship one on one. And first one that person for yourself before winning him for Christ. We talk about friendship evangelism. That's the way most fishes are caught in these days, especially in our context. So that's very important. Then furthermore, when you catch fish with a, with a rod, it's very important to make sure what bait you use. You will fail in catching shad with a corn or millipet. You, I don't think you'll catch any shad with that, except if it's very, very hungry. There's specific bait that you use in specific contexts. What works in an in a inland dam or lake will not prop, most likely not work in the sea. For the one kind of fish, will not work for another kind of fish. You must be selective to, and focused on who you want to catch for Jesus. That's why I'm also glad, by the way, that, uh, Harry, that, that, that you invest the faith promise money in various dams, various contexts, where you have people who have specialized. If I hear what, the, what God is using Dani for and, the number, and Erica and the number of people they were in their context, they use the right bait, they've got the right method to win people there for God. So you must also think about using the right bait for the, the right fish that you want to catch. Who are the people you are exposed to? What are the people that you want to win for the Lord? Make sure that you use the right bait to catch the right fish. What should that bait be? I can tell you what it should not be. Don't use arguments as bait. 
You will win, win very few people for the Lord Jesus by arguing about doctrines and churches and, 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 and different religions. Don't use arguments as a bait. I've, in my earlier ministry specifically, I've won quite a number of arguments, theological arguments. But in most cases, if not all, I've lost the person. So it's very, make sure that you don't use arguments. Don't use uh, as bait uh, the other person's sins. You will not hardly win a soul for Christ if you just bash upon something or someone and, go and, 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 and uh, accuse him from this sin or this sin and tell him how deadly it is and how far he is from God and how he will get lost with that sin. You won't be win people if you, if you have that approach by focusing on the person's sin. For him it may not be even sin. For him it's his normal lifestyle. A sheep don't roll in mud. It's not his nature. But a pig enjoys mud. Can't tell a pig, don't roll in the mud, it's sin. It's his na it's nature, it's his life. You first have to be changed from a, from a pig attitude and a pig heart to a sheep heart. Then he will himself refrain from, from mud and rolling in the mud. So make sure of that. And then also don't use as an argument or as, 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 a, as, a, as bait, don't use the other person's religion in the sense of uh, degrading it, uh, uh, trying to, 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 to tell the person how wrong is his religion. Tell him which is the, what you know what is the right, what's your experience, what is your, the, where, where the light and life for you come from. Don't be, don't be reactionary to that person's religion, but be positive about Jesus Christ. Preach Jesus Christ, live Jesus Christ, witness Jesus Christ. The strongest bait there is, the best bait there is, and you can believe what I'm telling you, is your testimony. It's important that we use every other method, but the best bait on a one-to-one -one basis is just telling what happened to you, where you come from, what God did for you. You know, we have the approach in our, in our own home, my, my daughter, uh, had acute fibromyalgia for 18 years in the acutest form. 18 years without, w w without a moment without pain. Pain day and night with all the other negative symptoms. And it's a sickness, fibromyalgia, that becomes very evident in our times. And one morning, in a moment of time, when my wife was, was called and urged by the Holy Spirit to pray for her and anoint her with, with oil. God healed her in a moment. And where two days before we have to carry her up the stairs in pain and agony to her room, I heard her running down the steps into my, into my office, telling Dad I'm healed in a moment's time. Now, I've checked it that we, we were at a, at a holiday resort of, uh, two, three months ago, and especially my wife, she uses that. She will, uh, I, I, if, I, if she's going to the swimming pool, when I pass there, I see she's busy with usually one woman. Well, she somehow connects to, and if she tells her what happens to her daughter, I can't tell you how many people she led to the Lord during that month or so that we've been there on holiday by just relating the miracle that happened in our house. If you don't have a testimony if, you have not be, uh, uh, if, the, if the Lord hasn't touched you, but if the Lord has touched you, I mean, people can argue your church relationship. People can argue with your theological convictions. People can even argue about your, your church denomination, but they can't argue about your, test, your experience your witness, your testimony. That's your experience. You can't tell me I haven't experienced it. And that's all that we have to do. We're not called to convince people. Nowhere in the Bible you'll find a text that tells you, you must go out and convince sinners of their sin. You'll always find every time where the commission is, 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 is mentioned, be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. Go out and witness. 
Because witnessing is the most powerful bait that you can find. And I pray that you have a witness as you sit here. Use it where it's appropriate. Make contact. People will be drawn to you like a fish being drawn to a bait. When they see the quality of your life, the fruit of the Spirit in your life, your, 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 your relationships, your attitude, your work ethics, those are the type of thing, things that will draw people and ask you, somehow, how did you manage that? They will give you opportunity on opportunity when you live a Christ-like life. You're not in the first place a hunter. You're a fisherman. You have to draw the fish. And you draw it by your, by your testimony. You draw it by your quality of life. And if they open the door to you and tell, ask you, tell me in some other way they ask you that. Tell me what happened. How did you do that? How did you manage? How do you get this right? You've got an open door to share what God has done for you. And I tell you, that is seed. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, when the Corinthians argue about, some say I'm from Paul, others from Apollos, others from Peter. He says, who are we? We are just co-laborers. He says, I plant, or I've planted. Apollos watered the, water, uh, the, the, the seeds, but God gives growth. It's not your and my task to give growth. We can't, but we can sow the seed. We can put the bait in the water. And some water the seeds. That's at this stage of my life, the major part of my ministry is to water the seed where, seeds where other people were already won by preachers and evangelists. To water the seed, but God gives growth. It's our calling to witness, not to convict. It's the Spirit's task, and He does it better than any one of us to convict the sinners. But there can be no growth if there's no seed in the soil. You have to sow the seed, some have to water that, and God gives growth. He convicts of sin and convinces of sin and, and, and judgment, and it's He that does the work. He gives life. Now, let me end off with a, with, a, with a major issue that I want to bring under your attention. Why did Jesus, in such a peculiar place, in a fishing boat, filled with fish, gave the commission to Peter and the other disciples who were with him, the two boats, that they will become fishers of men. Now the, ch the church of Jesus Christ is so, such a multifaceted, colorful entity that the Bible used different f uh, pictures, images, f meta metaphors to give expression to what the church is. Perhaps the best known metaphor is that of the body of Christ, which is, is so rich in meaning. Sometimes the church is called the, 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 the bride. Sometimes the building of which Christ is the cornerstone, the, the foundation. Sometimes we are called the garden of the Lord. Uh, sometimes we are called the, 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 the sheep, the flock of, his, of the Lord. Many they're not one against the other. It, it, it highlighted or highlights different aspects of the church. And I have no, uh, no doubt in my heart that the church also qualifies in the light of this context to be seen as God's fishing boat. God's fishing boat. So I want to say to you in conclusion, my brothers and sisters, God didn't call you or invite you to be a passenger on a passenger boat. I've had experience a few months, yeah, well it's a year ago already, when I and my wife for our 50th anniversary uh, had a, the privilege of for the first time to be together on a, on a boat cruise, luxury boat. And there were about four and a half thousand passengers and about two, two and a half thousand uh, crew. And we the passengers, what a time we had, it was costly. But it was a fantastic time. We were served. Everyone was, at, to our, was available for us. We were treated like kings. Uh, by the way, I didn't pay it for, my, for, for myself. Uh, someone else paid for that, just to, to put your heart at rest. Uh, <laughs> but we were treated like kings. Uh, 
but I tell you, the crew, they labored, they sweat, they ran, they worked. Unfortunately, this concept was also brought over to the church. For the greatest part of the church's history, since the Middle Ages started, we have the same principle of a passenger ship being conveyed over to the church. And now I talk in general because I think in this church it's quite different. But in general in the church world, the majority of the members in the church, those who come, come to church in any way, are not crew members. They are passengers. They like the church. It's a good fellowship to be in. It's nice to have a, a subculture of people who are like-minded. Oftentimes it's like a, a club mentality, especially if there's nice filter coffee like here. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a bad thing to come here. Uh, when you ne the church is necessary for marriages, uh, or the pastor to write a CV, CV or for, for, for funerals or whatever, the church is being, is being useful by, for the majority of people, but they are not crew members. Now, that, they're not part of the working crew. Now, the, 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 when you were saved, and I was saved, we were not invited or received a free ticket on a passenger ship to heaven. Just floating around, along, enjoy all the benefits, but ourselves do little as crew members. When the, the, the church of Jesus, and I want to state it emphatically, according to the scripture, is not a passenger bo a boat, it's a fishing boat. On a fishing boat, all the people on board has something to do with fishing. You will seldom hear or, or see or find out that there are passengers on a fishing boat. You will seldom hear of that. A fishing boat is almost exclusively reserved for crew members. And whether you are the captain or whether you are working in the kitchen of a commercial fishing boat or working on the engine or working with the nets or whatever, every person on that fishing boat is focused on one thing, whatever my contribution is, from whatever side is, what my speciality may be on a big fishing uh, boat. We've got one focus, we don't want to get back to the harbor with an empty boat. There must be as much as, as possible fish on that boat. That's the focus. That brings everyone together. And that's, uh, let me just say this in brackets while I'm re referring to this. Uh, you know, in the church we oftentimes refer to mission or think of missions as one aspect of the church's work. And there's youth and there's children and there's uh, mercy ministries and others. They, they are, it's like the spokes, spokes in a wheel. There's one spoke that is mission work, there's one spoke that is this and one spoke that is this. But that's not the right idea. Fishing for Jesus, winning souls for Jesus, cannot be just one aspect of the church's calling. It's the hub of the wheel, the hub. And every other spoke in that wheel, whether it be uh, teaching or whether it be uh, social mercy work that you do, or whether it be whatever in the, in the church, there, there are many ministries in the church. They are not disconnected from missions. They are connected to the hub, which is missions. From every ministry, there should be one focus, like on a fishing boat. This may be my focus area, this may be mine, this may be my task, this is my speciality. But all of us are connected to the hub, and there's one main purpose, and that's to win souls for Jesus. Now this church, this very special church, and I, want to say, I don't say this cheaply, I'm, I'm blessed and impressed by what God has been doing over the last couple of years in and through you, and I, I, I give credit to the leader and, and his team for this for their heart. But I, I, I want to ask you or tell you that God has many fishing boats, 
Actually, God has a, a great fleet of fishing boats. Some are more effective than others. But right across the world, in every nation, God has fishing boats. And there will come a day when the end is, has come, when God will say, this is, this is over. When all the fishing boats will gather to the eternal haven of rest. And what will, what will matter then is not how much you enjoyed the trip, or what you, how you've been treated or mistreated. What will count then is when he looks at the, in the, at the boat and see where is the fish. How many fish did you catch? And this is our calling. And I want to close with this question to each one of us. My brothers and sisters, our ministries differ. There are many ministries. There are a few ministries, five are mentioned in, in Ephesians, that are specifically there in Ephesians 4, verse 11 and 12, that God has given to equip and empower the members, the crew, for their ministry. Our ministries might differ very much, but they must all be connected to one purpose, catching fish. Have that in mind. And by the way, all of us, if you don't have a specific ministry that you can think I'm a this or a that, you are a witness. And there's no exception to the rule. Every believer is called to be a witness. And when God saved you, he enlisted you, not as a passenger on a luxury liner, but he, 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 he called you to be a member, a crew member on his fishing boat. And just this question to me and myself and you, what are you? Are you a crew member? Are you a crew member? Or are you a passenger? It may be time for some of us today to say, oh God, I want to refocus and remind myself I am called to be a crew member. You didn't have to be the preacher standing here, out in your work, out where you live. You can be a testimony and a witness to Jesus Christ and his love. Be a crew member, not a passenger. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the wonder of eternal life. And I thank you for the vehicle that you've chosen on this planet Earth to win people over to your kingdom so they also may experience eternal life. Lord, if we look at our country in spite of decades and centuries of the church being here, there's so many things that disturb us. So many people today that don't go to churches because you've never said to sinners to come to a church. You've always told the church to go to the sinners. Lord, I thank you that we can take liberty in the light of the example in Luke 5 to say that amongst all the other metaphors, your church is also a fishing boat. And I am a crew member. Lord, forgive me, forgive us where we have relaxed just as a passenger and neglected our responsibility, forgot our calling, and just enjoyed the service the church can offer. And I pray this from the depth of my heart, Lord, that your Holy Spirit, through the Word today in this building, will change people's mindset, their attitude, their hearts, and that they will cry out, Oh God, even though I may not do something spectacular, I want to be a crew member, contributing whatever I can, whether it be financial support. That's one way, important way, for the catching of fish, or my skills, my energy, my time, my money. But Lord, I don't want to be picked on one day and say, You have not been a crew member. You've just relaxed on the passenger lounge. lounge. Lord, I pray that you will help us to be what you called us for. Witnesses, workers, co-laborers, 
planting seed, watering seed, so that you can give growth to what we have engaged in. I ask it in Jesus' name.